Well, good morning. How is everybody? Boy, I tell you what, these lights are bright. I don't know who you were talking to in some cases there. Um, so we, we have a, uh, the, the, first of all, I want to thank AUSA for uh, basically hosting this panel, as well as the city of Huntsville for, at this point in time, hosting AUSA down here. I think this is a great opportunity. Uh, my time here when I was the PEO for TAC missiles, uh, it was a burgeoning sort of activity here. Uh, and clearly the city of Huntsville is connected very closely with the arsenal in trying to, if you will, better enable capabilities across a number of different technologies for the warfighter. Um, I just want to essentially sort of leverage off of some of the comments that General Cardone had. Um, as I reflect back upon my time when I first took over as a CIO, uh, there was this thing called OBY. How many in the room remember what OBY stood for? I'll just kind of a show of hands. I'll just kind of take a look. Anybody, everybody know what OBY was? Does it even mean anything to you? Well, it certainly did to the warfighter. It was known as uh, Operation Rampart Yankee and Operation Buckshot Yankee. Uh, and that was the overarching operation where, in many cases, we had these uh, basically thumb drives that got infected. And it spread throughout the entire warfighting force to the point that there was a directive put out that we had to shut down all uses of thumb drives throughout the force. That may have sounded kind of easy, but the impact was severe in terms of operational issues with respect to aviation, logistics, any number of things that were happening there in the force. Um, but it was more to the point at the time then that we had to figure out how to fix it. And we had so many folks involved with how to fix it. There was NETCOM, there was the CIG-6, there was INSCOM, there was the first IOBIT command. And in many cases, we didn't even know how many systems we had in the field. Every day we had to report into STRATCOM how many computers did we find, how many computers were infected, how many computers were fixed, and how many computers were redeployed. And it got to be a point that these numbers would vacillate such that uh, the commander of STRATCOM came back as said, you know, the data that you keep sending me looks like the Dow Jones Industrials. It's up, it's down. Do you guys not have a clue what you have? And the answer was no, we didn't. And so as a result of that, we began to sort of take a step back and look at what we needed. And so that was the initial discussions about setting up something called Army Cyber Command, which was all about the need for an operational structure uh, to meet the operational needs for the warfighter for a secure and safe network, or as General Cardone said, the ability to have freedom of action in the network, as well as the ability to deny those who want to try to impact that freedom of action. But cyber goes across the entire thing, land, sea, air, and space. And so, you know, it's not so much a physical domain, as he said, it's a man-made, but it sort of integrates across all those, if you will, physical domains. And at the end of the day, there's a lot of moving parts. Technology is moving. Doctrine is changing. Soldiers are becoming more advanced in terms of the use of their capabilities. And so the real need right now is to begin to take a look at all those particular aspects, and we've assembled, if you will, a panel to kind of talk about that. Uh, starting off, again, we'll have General Cardone. He'll probably be asked a few more questions here, as the, as the case may be. Uh, there's never enough questions to be answered in cyber. Uh, next to him, we got uh, Lieutenant General Mark Bowman, who is the director of C4 Cyber, at the, as well as the CIO for the Joint Staff, talking about some of the issues as it relates to not only the Army impact in the Joint Staff, but this whole thing in terms of where the Defense Department is going with the Joint Information Environment, and what does that mean for cyber. Next, we have Major General Tom James, who is the director Com of Command Center of Excellence at TRADOC there at Fort Leavenworth. Uh, you know, the whole need about having operators. So it's not so much technology, it's not so much processes. You don't have people functioning here. It doesn't happen. And yet we've got to have adaptive, agile, very, in many cases, technical warfighters out there. And so Tom will talk a little bit about that landscape as well as operational support to the commander. Colonel Maureen O'Connor, who is the director of the Joint Force Headquarters in Cyber, We'll talk a little bit about, you know, what is going on trying to integrate not only the combat combatant commands, but also what are we doing with respect to the service component and how is that happening uh, from the standpoint of delivering capability, that is, the cyber capability to the warfighter. Uh, Bob Fecto is now currently the CIO for SEIC. Uh, we'll talk a little bit more about kind of what's happening in the commercial space. How do we take advantage of that? 
as well as, in many cases, leveraging across the processes, the technology, and basically bringing that into the warfighting force. And finally, Lieutenant Colonel Paul Stanton, uh, who is the tech liaison to in, in Army Cyber. We'll talk a little bit more about the tools. I mean, we, we talked a little bit, uh, or General Cardone did, about you know, the whole notion of building out these forces, these 41 teams. These 41 teams are going to have to have some tools. And working as well throughout the commercial space in issues like big data, virtualization, cloud computing. How do we take advantage of that, and how do we bring that into the war fight? So I'm going to kick this off at this point in time, get, turn it over to General Bowman. Each one of the panel members will give an opportunity to kind of give a little perspective and then we'll open it up for what we hope to be a very engaging dialogue with the community here. Thanks, sir. What an honor it is to be here today. Uh, operationalizing cyber is, is a theme for our panel. Operationalizing means begin, invoke, enlist, engage, initiate. We've been doing that for a while, a long while. We were defending and operating networks since the first one went out. We've got to make this operational now. We've got to make cyber work for us now. Because no matter how you look at it, we are outnumbered. It doesn't matter what metric you try to figure out to come up with a better answer in our behalf. We're outnumbered as DOD, as the U.S. government, and as a nation. The cyber enemy is an enemy that's potentially more dangerous than any individual or machine than we'd ever, we have ever known in the history of the world. We've got to be able to defend against the threat. And again, it's not just DOD, it is the nation. And the only way to do that is to be mutually supportive. We've got a bunch of different organizations and activities out there that have to work together. The toughest part of that is getting people to let go of their service or their individual personal culture, where they have to operate within their own organizational bodies and they don't care about anybody else's. Those organizational boundaries, cultures, and whatever way you want to divide this organization up or this entity up that we're trying to defend against is not relevant in cyber. Cyber reaches through everything. It means protecting intellectual property. The theft of IP is the greatest transfer of wealth in history. Why would another country or adversary or even a friend spend a bunch of money on R&D to come up with something when they can steal it from somebody else and start from a roll and start or full speed? When we do business as DOD with industry, there's a trust that we have with industry and a trust that industry has to have with us, that that intellectual property will be protected, that we will put in the right measures to make sure that it stays protected. And then, if it is leaked or compromised, we know and adapt from that. In my mind, there's lots and lots of short-term wins associated with business today. We can make some choices that are going to make that business a bunch of money for maybe a decade. And following that, there'll be no more business. There's tough choices we need to make out there. We need to make sure we make the right ones for industry and our nation. Again, this is a team approach. It's about a joint information environment. As was mentioned earlier, our networks are joint. Our IT is joint. Whether we want to admit it or not, it's inherently joint, and we'll get more and more so as we go along. We will never fight as an army alone again. We will never fight as a nation alone again. We'll fight with coalition members. We'll fight with other services, partnering the whole way. The environment we have must be interoperable day one of phase one of any operations, which means it has to be interoperable during peace, during phase zero. The joint information environment is not a program of record, nor will it ever be. It's about mission effectiveness. It's about security. And lastly, and clearly least, it's about efficiencies. Many, many people want to just jump on that efficiencies and see how much money we can turn back at the end of the year. That's not the primary focus of the joint information environment. With regard to JIE, our Army is clearly the, the best performing service involved. They've grabbed it, they've run with it, 
They continue to make it better. They set the example for other services, agencies, combatant commands. Our Army's on top of it. Letting go of email, not running it ourselves, was a hard thing for some people to do. But the decision was made and executed. The decision to let go of the brand Army took about three seconds. The Army is, is headed in the right direction. The other services need to follow in that way. Networks, IT, all require trust. And to have that trust, we've got to have the right cyber. All senior leaders today get and understand the value of IT and comms and know we can't do our job without it. So we look forward to partnering with everyone here and everybody else that's working on this to come up with the best answers and to adapt as we go. Thank you. Thank you. Tom? Make sure I'm up here. Yeah, just Is it, okay, I'm talking. Th th thank you, G General Sullivan, AUSA, uh, everyone here, ladies and gentlemen, thank you for this opportunity. I am uh, Tom James. I'm the Mission Command Center of Excellence Director at Fort Leavenworth, Kansas uh, Combined Arms Center. And I represent roughly 400 civilians and soldiers that operate out of the old disciplinary barracks there at Fort Leavenworth. And uh, we represent the commander. You know, our mission really is to develop leaders to exercise mission command in the current and future complex operating environments. And it's key, when, when you think of mission command, there are three components. There's the philosophy, and that's the commander's ability through, through his authorities and direction to enable disciplined initiative with subordinate leaders in this complex environment that we're talking about. And then we have the war fighting functions, the task the commander performs and the staff performs, and how it pulls together to enable the commander in this current complex operating environment. And then the third component is the system that enables the commander to do so. So if I can take you back uh, pre-9-11, and I'm standing in a tank turret in the central quarter at the National Training Center, and my biggest concern is the world-class Op 4 regiment attacking through the central corridor and our ability to defend against the world-class Op 4. Well, I can tell you nowadays, and having spent some time out at the National Training Center in our decisive action training environment last year, the world-class Cyber Op 4 from 1st I.O. Command can pull a brigade command team, a combat team, to its knees in minutes, not hours like the regiment did. So we gotta think how we do that. We see our mission to connect the power of America to the soldier in the foxhole and turret in contact with the enemy, whether it be in Afghanistan or wherever on the planet, we have to do that. And that ability transfers across or operates across cyberspace. And so I have two major takeaways for you today. The first one is, and it's been highlighted by so many today already, is that cyber is a war fighting domain. All of the principles apply in our doctrine, apply in cyber. And as General Cardone mentioned, it's a man-made cyber domain, so the human context and dimension is so critical. And that's what we represent when we talk about the commander. And so we gotta figure out how we do that. And the second piece is, it's commander's business. It's no longer, let's take this cyber thing and to the intel folks or to the signal folks, which are all critical players, but it's the commander that has to understand, visualize, describe, when we talk about intelligence preparation of the battlefield, there are cyber considerations. We've got to understand all the domains. The operations process has to have cyber considerations, and commanders need to understand that business and what their teams bring to the table. You know, when we look to the future operating environment that was highlighted yesterday by General Walker, it is extremely complex. We're talking about innovative, adaptive, globally connected threats embedded in the population. We're looking at asymmetric threats that are going to attempt to attack our weaknesses and avoid our strengths, and they're going to push high-tech weapon systems down to the lowest level. We're looking at electronic warfare and cyber capabilities uh, with state and non-state actors that will impact the future operational environment, and then uh, sophisticated information operations campaigns targeting our national will. So what do we have to do about that from a mission command perspective? Well, we got to be able to take information and make it knowledge and get it to the commander on the battlefield where it is needed, where he and his organization, he or she's organization, is developing the situation through action and contact with the enemy. So how do we do that? We have to be able to protect our networks, establish redundant and resilient communications capability, and be able to retain the ability to fight degraded. That is the environment that we'll be in. And we've got to be able to improve mission command on the move and our link to the joint force 
so that we can create that joint synergy. Now, what are we doing about that? What's going on now in uh, cyber related to Mission Command? In the Center of Excellence, we have the Combined Arms Doctrine Division. And so we're getting after it with doctrine. Our unified land operations, our ADP 3.0, identifies cyberspace as a domain, and it talks about cyber electromagnetic activities and what the commander needs to understand as it pulls that together in, in mission command. Additionally, we, uh, we look to the IPB I talked about uh, earlier and really taking all of the war fighting functions uh, that General Gardone talked about. We have to be able to intelligence, movement, maneuver, and fires all within the cyber domain, and how does that work, and how does it relate to the other domains? FM 338, Cyber Electromagnetic magnetic, magnetic Activities, was actually published this week. And so it's out on the web, our doctrinal website now, and so that's a movement in the right direction to really educate our commanders and leaders on cyber activities. FM 312, Cyberspace Operations, which is nested with the Joint Force, is, is going to be out for staffing here shortly, and our target is uh, June of 2014 to have that FM finalized. And then under our education system, we've developed a cyber elective for CGSC and ILE at Fort Leavenworth, and we're continuing to refine classified versions of that elective. Uh, we're developing a cyberspace curriculum uh, that we should have out in the fall that will range from basic entry level all the way through general officer training and really be integrated in our pre-command course as we send our leaders out uh, to lead our formations. And then in training, we talked about the combat training centers, you know, the world-class op for, cyber op for, and how we embed that into all of the CTCs to include the mission command training program and how commanders have to deal with that complexity on the future battlefield. And our lessons learned program is capturing all of that and General Cardone charged us with creating a quarterly cyber security bulletin that we will put on the, secure, on the classified side that captures these lessons and informs commanders so that they can develop their organizations to be able to take on uh, this portion of our war fight. And, and that's all I have. Thank you for letting me address you today. Thanks, Tom. Maureen? Good morning, and thank you very much for allowing us to have this conversation here this morning. I'm Colonel Maureen O'Connor, and I represent the operational force that we're building. So General Cardone spoke to that today. The 41 teams that the Army is building are part of the 133 that the Joint Force collectively is, are building. And they're all really coming out of the cyber service, cyber components, as we're building these teams. And what we recognize very quickly is the C2 for these teams is absolutely critical and essential. And so in addition to the teams, there's Joint Force Headquarters Cyber that are being built today by all the different service cyber components. And we say joint, we have Army has the responsibility to build one. And what we mean by that is these cyber mission teams are part of the joint enterprise. So the Joint Force Headquarters Cyber that we will build in the Army in Georgia will have teams from the Army, Navy, Air Force, Marines, in direct support of combatant commanders. We have an allocation for our piece. The 10th Fleet in their build of their command headquarters has an allocation for other, other combatant commanders, as does the Marines and the Air Force. So right now, building that, while we are absolutely keen and working side by side, the Cyber Center of Excellence and the, and the Mission Command Center of Excellence in a TRADOC fashion, we really are building this team and building this operational force and building the doctrine along with it that we're going to be operating on right now. So as we do this, people is critical. The people that we bring on to this force and the people that we train are absolutely critical. We've learned a lot, we've learned a lot of mistakes, but we've also learned a lot of successes. So the skill sets that we have brought into the environment there was a lot of assumptions going in. Should they be from the intelligence community? Should they be from the signal community? Yes. Should they also be from the maneuver community? Yes. All, of, all across the space, as we develop our operational context and how we're going to operate within cyber domain, but also integrate within the rest of the domains is, is critical. This year, we've begun really heavily to start engaging our combatant command, supporting commands. And what the combatant commands obviously are trying to do is figure out exactly how this cyber support helps them and where, where and how we develop operational capabilities within the domain, but much more significantly, 
How do we integrate that and synchronize with the rest of the domains in support of their operational context? As we do that, we're recognizing that we need planners, targeteers, we need operators, we need people that understand all the rest of the domains as well as the cyberspace domain itself. And how do we achieve the effects we're trying to achieve while meeting the commander's intent? So as we move forward, we're also looking clearly to what changes do we need to make in how we do business today? From a defense perspective, we talked a lot today. General Cardone outlined the very sophisticated actor set that we are now facing from the threat. Today, we absolutely realize the connection between U.S. Cyber Command and NSA that they created in the beginning of the cyberspace effort and the intelligence that's available, the intelligence that drives our threat-based operations. How do we defend tomorrow is very much based on what we see and how we characterize the threat today. And what do we offer to those combatant commanders, to our Army, to those key terrain capabilities that we have across the globe? How do we characterize the threat, the specific threats to that, and then how do we particularly defend that? And then how do we deliver effects that are absolutely going to counter our adversary's ability to inhibit our freedom of maneuver? I don't want to take much time because I know you have many questions, but greatly appreciate the opportunity to talk to you today. Thank you, Maureen. Bob? First of all, I want to thank General Sullivan and AUSA and all of the, as a representative of industry, I'm kind of up here in the wrong uniform. <laughs> but I, I think what's most important to understand is that I had to read all of the new doctrine for Army Cyber to prepare for the panel, and it still comes down to some of the basics that I think we should discuss. The first is, is that I really take a people, process, technology approach to this process, to the problem. And if you realize how much change you are introducing into the environment, which we, the contract environment, has to respond to, I'm not sure we have a clear picture of what's needed. Because frankly, if you take all the agencies and all the separate commands and all the separate contracts, this is a very complex response environment. And not everybody's doing it the same way, so you have many, many solutions, which I'm not sure we're mastering in any kind of environment. So let's talk about the people. Today, first of all, the, the process is a barrier protection environment. You think you've got everything, you put it inside your, your network, you put a firewall up, you put some NIDs and technology together and you get somebody to watch it. And the people who watch it are generally not capable of looking at all the data that's coming off of the systems in any kind of real time. So our expectation that you're actually gonna be able to protect yourself is probably not well-founded because you usually find out that you've had a problem after it occurred. So this post, um, this post data recovery, the failure to protect sensitive data in that kind of role is generally a recovery operation, not an uh, operation of protection. We, we cannot really define generally what the data sets are that you really want to protect. So consequently, giving a solution Delivering a technology is pretty complicated because the data keeps moving around, as well as the practices. They keep changing, so as we put one function in play, uh, the contract environment changes again. The second part is, I think we're asking people to do stuff that they don't really know how to do. Um, if you can't have people do it, and really the solution for me is how do I get the 14,000 people within SAIC to be able to do a common practice so that we can protect the internal data that belongs to us and it belongs to you effectively, we have to make this stuff a little more tangible. So I'm starting on the people side of it because I really believe we've got to be the partner with you to grow the environment. We've heard there's not enough training environment spaces to get people certified. I'm not sure that's what the role of the government should be by itself. We have to somehow synchronize the academia the development of technologies into a development program that generates a force that's going to be necessary to counteract the numbers of people that are facing us in the attack vector. The second part is that I, I believe that the adversaries, since we know they have um, ability to penetrate the environment on demand, we probably have to move backwards into a more data-centric protection environment. We surely have to define more of the crown jewels identify where they're at and, and put in place structures, encryption, 
in depth that allows us to protect that in a better just, that means that all employees or military members and government members have to identify what is that most sensitive data and apply a protection in there that we haven't applied in the past. Secondly, seamlessly, it, um, it has to in integrate with the environment on, the, on a probably much broader scale. And when I say that, inside industry, I don't really treat cyber as a separation of uh, technology service delivery. It's integrated in everything we do from the programmatic level all the way through the end state of the architecture. I would like to say I have it right, but that's probably not correct either. I think they're here inside the network, and my job is to protect and minimize the amount of impact they have on operations every day in a risk-based approach, much like you're trying to do. But I'm not sure that we've integrated cyber, or at least network protect or service protection of our data as part of the way we want our employees to work, because sometimes it's too hard to do. So I, I think there's somewhat of a, let's make it simpler, let's make sure everybody's commonly pulling on the rope to achieve the better design. Users have to be able to adhere to some practices that we design and implement. And how many times have you put something out there and nobody knows how to run it? I, I know when I was in the Army, I did that a couple of times. It was very expensive and not very well thought of by my boss. But the fact is, is that some of the stuff we deliver is just too darn hard to use. Or at least it's not understood how it applies to the master pulling on the rope. So let's talk about consistency of requirements a little bit. The first thing is cybersecurity capability, cyber operationalization, has to have people that are flexible and capable and drive the increased integration between the government and the civilian industries, because frankly, we're all connected. In, in the cyber world, it's more so as, as ever, as you've seen from the pictures and the discussion. So the question is, how do I synchronize multiple efforts in a common way to achieve an objective inside of the contract world for supporting the government? And this is increasingly difficult because you get a threat and they tell you what you want to engineer towards and the threats change by the time you get a solution out the door. So yes, we have to increase the cycle of that. But I don't know if we've attractively put the collective brain power of both industry, academia, and government leaders in the same bucket to achieve a common objective of where the investment needs to go. Uh, we spend millions of dollars in one-offs and somehow I don't think they synchronize into a common fabric. And I think industry could help better if the requirements were more in some kind of strategy that actually gets threaded together so you know where your fabric is, where you fit into the, into the fabric. So the complexity with which we see the requests coming out and our ability to answer them get hampered because we're not sure how it, f it fits together inside of the enterprise. And, and I think that the government has that problem as well when they think about the enterprise in a whole. Lastly, this engineering effort in a common thing is I'm not sure we know how to put it into your system effectively. And for industry to spend a lot of money, I would love to make sure that R&D was point on a solution to help you fix a cyber problem. But we'll do all the R&D, you'll come up with some solutions and then not get selected and then what do you do with that lost investment? And somehow, if we can recover some of that conceptual stuff that's built in all these R&D efforts across a space and synchronize them to something in the future, that partnership needs to be figured out a little bit more in the future. I think industry can help you, and I think industry will uh, obviously come up to the next generation of design. I'm just not sure that if we do it a thousand points of light, if we're gonna get really core competency and synchronization to fix the cyber problem. And boy, I really want to help you, and, and I know the whole industry does, and we're here ready to help wherever we can. Again, thanks a lot for letting me come up here and, and represent some of the industry challenges. Thanks, Bob. Paul? Thanks, sir. I'm Lieutenant Colonel Paul Stanton, and, and incredibly honored to have the opportunity to, to briefly describe the, the progress we're making towards equipping uh, this, this evolving force that General Cardone and, and Colonel O'Connor described earlier. Uh, specifically looking at some of the technical capabilities necessary to achieve 
uh, or at least approach the technical operational overmatch that uh, General Walker and General Phillips referred to yesterday in the cyber domain. Um, as both General Cardone and, and General James described, cyber aligns very, very ni nicely to existing Army doctrine. Uh, ultimately, we have a responsibility to see the battlefield and provide operational relevant, relevant information to the commander in support of uh, his, his or her decision cycle. Uh, the difference lies in how we see the battlefield. We see the battlefield in cyberspace through data. Um, and, and there is a, an enormous uh, volume, velocity, and variety of that data. Uh, if I deploy an infantry scout to overwatch a road intersection, uh, th that scout will report back when a certain number of vehicles tra traverse the road network. Uh, and that becomes a, a strong indicator to, to the decision maker on, on what to do next. In cyberspace, the avenues of approach are hundreds, if not thousands, within a, an operating environment. Additionally, the, the, the vehicles, if you will, that traverse that network are in the millions. Uh, and, and so there's just a, a vast amount of, of data that we have to have the right capabilities and tools to translate into information in support of uh, the, the decision process for mission commanders. So what are we doing? Well, we're, we're on the right azimuth. As General Bowman described, the joint informational environment is, is central towards standardizing our network, our sensor grid, and our compute platforms, and standardizing at the data layer. To, to borrow General Cardone's uh, analogy, th this is the, the road network, the underground plumbing of that city that, that he was referring to. Uh, so we're putting that foundation in that allows us to, to get to some degree of the standardization that Mr. Fecto was just referring to as necessary um, for future partnerships with industry. So in parallel, we're also looking at how to build the right uh, analytics. How do I make sense out of this vast amount of, of, of data in the right time frames to support mission commander's decisions? Um, relevance is critical. When I literally have billions of, of data points, which ones are relevant to feed back to the commander? And how do I determine that in, in, in very tight time constraints? The relationships between the data, how do I determine when I have those hundreds if not thousands of avenues of approach and millions of events, how do I determine which ones are correlated and, and related to one another in some interesting way? It's not as, as neat a package as counting the number of vehicles that traverse the, the, the road intersection, that, that problem that the scout had. How do I determine what actually is an indicator of threat activity on, on the network? And ultimately, how do I get towards causality? How do I know that one event actually led to another event uh, such that I can start to get to, to the left and become predictive in nature? Uh, these are incredibly challenging problems. Uh, th these are data science type problems uh, where I need the, the, the big data platform, the ability to do the computation. I need the domain knowledge, the understanding of what the mission is, but then I also have to have the, the, the mathematical rigor, the science to build the right algorithms to, to determine how to make sense out of that vast amount of, of data. These are becoming new core competencies for our cyber force. How do I manage the data and then develop the analytics and use those analytics in a manner that translates back to supporting mission command? Uh, I have to understand what's in the realm of the possible in terms of my compute capabilities in relationship to, to the data. If I can't run an algorithm with the amount of data that I have available to me within the decision support timeline that I'm presented with the, uh, by the mission commander, it does me no good. It does me no good to deliver that, deci that decision support after the decision had to be made. So I have to understand the technical components of, these, uh, of the capabilities in order to build the, the right algorithms and the right analytics. I also have to understand how precise my results need to be. If a Google-like answer is sufficient, where I'm going to return to you the, the, the top 20 answers and the chances of one of them being relevant to your search query on the initial page that, uh, that, that I provide, well, then that's good enough. And you'll come back and continue to use Google. There are certain missions where good enough is probably OK within, within, our, uh, within our mission space. But there are others that you can uh, likely think of off the top of your head where that's not the case. And so that adjusts the types of analytics and the types of tools, the types of applications that I can run on top of the data as it relates back to specific missions. 
So I have to have this very skilled workforce that understands what's in the realm of the, po the possible in terms of the data and the computation. I have to understand the mission, and then I have to be able to map the right applications back to uh, s solving the, those, uh, those mission critical information requirements for the, uh, for the mission commander. These are, these are huge challenges. Now, we're working toward establishing the infrastructure and the platforms to, de to get to some degree of standardization, uh, but there is, uh, there's a lot of work to be done in terms of building the right tools and the applications in order to come back and support the, uh, the mission requirements. I appreciate the opportunity to talk. Okay, Paul, thank you. Uh, well, I think we have satisfied one of the requirements, and that is that the panel will stop talking before, you know, the panel time frame expires, so that's, that's one good news. Um, we do have a couple questions, and I think even as we've, we've talked about this here, some things have sort of come to mind uh, from my perspective as I've listened to the entire uh, group here kind of walking down the line. But, but let me kind of, if you will, address some of the audience questions first, because I think they're, they're kind of pertinent, and I'll, I'll start out with maybe an easy one. Uh, this is for General Cardone. Uh, the CSA has described a new MOS for cyber. Are we going to establish a cyber branch in the future? So a lot of work is ongoing. Uh, we are going to have a way to manage the cyber force, whether it's a branch or a uh, career mission, uh, or CMF, uh, uh, career, management. career management force. Uh, we're, uh, it's going to be one of those two things. I've advocated pretty strongly that, uh, that if it has a branch designation, that it be a maneuver branch. And, because that would kind of break a lot of the, uh, if we're going to operationalize it, we, we want you to be able to maneuver on this terrain. And so I think you'll see in the next couple of months, I think you'll see a number of, uh, of announcements on this as we look to better manage the people, as I discussed earlier, for both their leader development and talent management. Okay. Um, the next question I'm going to give to Tom. Um, this is about training, so this probably ought to be right down your alley here. Uh, so the question becomes, what cyber training, you, you talked about what's being done now at the Fort Leavenworth, but the question comes is, what sort of cyber training is being offered at the war colleges? How much training, what type of training, and in some cases, what kind of training do you think they need? And, and again, remember now, at the war college, we, do, we have digital uh, aliens, not digital natives here, okay? <laughs> That's it. We're, we're looking at the curriculum for the War College right now to, to make sure that we're straight. I think if I could go back to the, the point about the CMF and the branch, one of the key things is having the Center of Excellence because the Center of Excellence allows us to do coordination and the synergy created between COEs that are related to the war fighting functions really help this. And it helps us design the curriculum for the War College. And so having a COE that's focused on cyber will help us do that. But right now, I, I think it's more of, of an educational aspect to the War College, where, where they're talking about cyber and recognizing it as a domain, and it's integrated into the courses, but I don't think there's actually a course on cyber within the War College right now. You know, we've worked the one for ILE. I can talk to that one because it's at Leavenworth. But we're trying to shape uh, the task and requirements and the learning outcomes associated with cyber to help shape the War College and other courses that the Army's teaching. PCC being a priority because those, uh, for, those uh, leaders are going out to the force. Okay. Anybody else care to comment about need for the War College? <laughs> There's a lot of work on going with the War Colleges. There was a study you know, a while back that said the Army was last. Actually, the Army didn't participate, so I'm not sure it was last. But it's clear that uh, the National Defense University is really pushing this hard. They have a number of electives, et cetera. I think there's growing recognition by all the services as they recognize the domain, they recognize you have to operate on it, that we've got to equip, better equip the commanders and future senior staff officers and how they're going to uh, make cyber part of everything they do. Yeah. Okay, very good. Uh, Maureen, this question is for you. What, what role do you see industry playing in the creation and equipping of the cyber mission teams? So thanks, sir. Um, I see it as a, it, there's a huge role for industry. Um, as we're bro growing the cyber mission forces and we talked about the operators first, the targeters, the planners, et cetera, they need tools. And the tool developer skill set is in particular the most difficult to recruit, retain, 
train, et cetera. And we look to our, initially our civilian portions of our um, force to do that, but really they even need a stronger background from industry. So exactly the requirements that we need will evolve. As we build this force and as the commanders, whether they are combatant commanders or service um, mission sets that these operators are working for and towards, we'll have a much better understanding of what, what we need. What we do know is that the acquisition models that we have in place now aren't exactly as responsive enough. We already know that now. So how we help as the government, the industry partners, build to our requirements while giving us the flexibility and agility we need to adapt those to meet the changing threat conditions that change rapidly is really the, the hard task. But I see clearly a huge role for industry. Okay. Thank you. Uh, th this is kind of a question I would say across the panel a little bit. Uh, it's talking about cyber investment and retaining it. And the question is, how do we ensure that our cyber investment remains our cyber investment? How do we ensure our cyber training and our cyber warriors remain our cyber warriors? It appears that there is an enormous opportunity for neither uh, to be possible. Um, so I think I'm going to kind of, if you will, start out a little bit here with uh, give this to uh, General Bowman uh, because we talked a little bit about this, whether it's our investment or a joint investment or whatever, and then uh, I'll pass it off to a couple other panel members. Uh, sir, just clarification. Uh, our O U R. O U R. Not yes. A R. Okay. That's that's right. Oh. O U R. <clears throat> this uh, cyber investment is is absolutely needed. Uh, it's needed by everyone. It's a team approach. Uh, I think we're going to see the ebb and flow of, of uh, cyber experts between industry and, and defense, and I, I think we need uh, to have that. When Mo got the question earlier about um, how does industry play in the, in the cyber teams, I wrote down contractors um, was what I was thinking about for an answer. I think that the cyber workforce, we really, really need to be recruiting interns out of the colleges and bring them in, give them jobs while they're going to school, get them a clearance, and start growing them. Because the average age of our civil servant uh, is pretty far up there. Uh, we need to grow some new talent. We need to get some of the new guys in with some of the good ideas. And they need to be able to sit there and ask the old guys who are doing nuclear C2, hey, how come you're doing it that way? Why can't we do it this way? We need to grow those things with a new workforce, a workforce that ebbs and flows, whether they work directly for DOD or work out in an industry protecting the intellectual property that the in industry has. It, it's more concerning to me than, than ever before when you, when you sit there and you think that in the time it takes me to click a mouse, millions of trades are being made automatically on, on Wall Street. So our enemy might not be the kid next door. It might be the millions of computers that he co-opted and targeted us with. So, ahead, so um, Bob, I was going to ask you to on this investment. So first, it's very hard to protect code, because once code's out there, it's out there. and. Anything, if you just follow the Stuxnet, uh, they reverse engineered it, and now there's different versions out there being run against the system. So anything that's ever used, it's out there and now becomes available to any adversary. So as this is what I talked about, the importance of competence and the character. Now, for the last part about how we protect our intellectual capital, meaning our people, uh, when you talk to some of these young uh, men and women, you're pretty inspired because most of them say uh, this is exactly what they envision themselves doing in life. And it's when you take them off that that they get a little bit disillusioned. Working with the uh, units to get a better uh, human wraparound around these individuals, uh, much like we've done to our combat forces, you know, the work that General Jorjo has done, Surgeon General, to work on all the human sides of this. We're trying to figure out what does that mean in cyberspace, but uh, there's no question that they're going to be heavily recruited. They could be recruited by the adversaries. However, most of ours get security clearances, 
And I think a lot of it is about keeping them inspired and motivated to keep working in the space. But Bob, I know you deal with this a lot. So, so I'm really passionate about this because um, I'm going to draw an example back to 9-11. I work with General Alexander, and we connected the counterterrorism workforce around the globe in what I would consider to be a precursor to crowdsource attack of the counterterrorism problem. So what we did is we joined 4,500 counterterrorism analysts on a common network on a common portal that allowed us to do this. And we actually achieved results that were beyond what anybody would have anticipated. And we had some precision, which I can't go into about how good it was, but the fact that we had a, a phone call line that everybody could call on and talk about one common topic, and so this is a way to keep your force engaged. And the cyber, the cyber call line or the cyber integrated crowdsource within industry doesn't exist today. It does exist inside the government, but probably not to that level of degree because we haven't had a marshalling event that creates the need to drive it. But I would think that if you put in the COE strategy with a network of um, crowdsource or at least thought thinkers that are con continuously linked together in uh, video, audio, and code sharing capability to drive against the target that they identify themselves, you're, you're going to get hacker level response to uh, really broad challenges. And I think capturing the intellectual proudness of our unique warriors in the cyberspace has to have that, that very interesting connectivity. And based on my Intel background, um, watching how we developed uh, people at Fort Hood capable of prosecuting a target all the way around the globe on the Trojan network concept, maybe you need the Trojan network concept for cyber and, and have the constant, this is the challenge of the day, who wants to take it on? And then I'm not sure it doesn't extend outside of the government's boundaries into industry and creating a collaborative environment that mm, a lot of these wannabe next generation cyber people are going to want to connect to. If we can create that, I have that feeling that that's probably the success concept of the future. Not sure how it would manifest it today, but boy, on a short notice, that seems to be not a bad idea to me. Well, yeah, go ahead. So, so Bob, I think you're, I think you're right. So, I mean. David DeWalt from FireEye, you know, he and his little YouTube, he says, when you go to a cybersecurity conference, there's 1,300 vendors there, and they don't talk to each other. <laughs> and so it's kind of, uh, I think what you're describing is absolutely innovative. We've got to get after this. And I, it's a perfect marriage between academia, government, and industry that we need. And maybe I should copyright that now. <laughs> yeah, I was going to say, you might want to do that. Let me uh, sort of switch a little bit, too. We've talked a little bit about the military training, but obviously part of our army is all the civilians. And I've got two questions here about civilian training and so forth. So I'll, I'll read this. I'll read both of these questions because they are kind of related. But it says, how do we bridge the sustainment gap in training and education for our civilian workers? Many IT leaders have not attended training or school for more than 20 years. And to defeat the threat, they must understand the threat. The next question related to that, it says, the cyber domain has and will continue to evolve quickly. How do we plan to train our civilian workforce down to the PM level to ensure our engineers are evolving system designs to counter the operational threats? This is critical to enabling our soldiers to fight in this domain. So uh, the question really gets down to, we've talked a lot about the military and military training and so forth. The question I would have for the panel in some cases is what are we doing to sort of support training for our civilian force? And I will, let's see. Tom, I'll let you take a whack at it. You're the train guy, so. <laughs> yes, sir. Uh, you know, what, what, what are we doing? I mean, it's critical to go to have that. So what, what are we doing to sort of expand opportunities there for the civilian workforce for cyber training? Right. Uh, you know, I, as, as far as specifics, I don't really have any. I do know that in our CGSC, we're looking at involving civilians and, and bringing them into the fold in some of our military courses that have cyber electives and cyber training. And, uh, and so, th so that's really the primary uh, one that I know of from a Leavenworth perspective. You know, I think it is critically important. We have 60% of the Mission Command Center of Excellence is civilians. And so we got to look at creative ways that we can train our civilians, especially as, as we have a piece of this linkage into cyber from a Mission Command perspective. But I don't have specific courses or training at this point. Sir, Paul, sir, looks like could, you want to say something. Yes, sir, I could interject this slide. So 
I, I've been working with, uh, with RDECOM and, and their team at looking at the, the possibilities of expanding uh, cyber-focused uh, career fields, uh, specifically looking at the, the at very early mission analysis stage, but conceptually, how do we how do we take a civilian newly hired employee and integrate them with the operational force and vice versa? Uh, so so that very early on in in the development, the uh, the civilian gains the perspective of what the operational requirements are. And then the operator gains the perspective of what's in the realm of the possible in terms of computational complexity and being able to, to solve hard problems. Uh, so it's in, in the very early stages of developing the, the mission analysis for such a concept, but we're actively pursuing uh, that thought process. Very good. Thank uh, you. Go ahead, on the joint staff, on a much smaller scale, of course, we've implemented a uh, uh, professional development training for our civilians because it, it's lacking. They know it. We know it. And we have the opportunities because NDU is a chairman's controlled activity. It's right across the river. They have the I College uh, where CIO courses are taught and we can go and, and send our guys there. Down in Hampton Roads where we have a number of people as well, we have uh, many, many courses taught at the Armed Forces Staff College uh, down there that we're working our people into. And then that the exchange of our people and inviting others in from outside to do those professional development courses has given us pretty positive feedback with, with the civilians. It, it is clearly something that has been lacking. So I have a couple questions here related to you know, support from industry. First of all, you know, with anything with respect to developing systems, you've got to start with requirements. So there are two questions here about requirements. Who in the Army is the lead to develop requirements for Army cyber S&T development? And does our cyber have a requirements document it can share with industry? So I'll turn this over to Colonel Cardone and Paul, do you uh, want to take a whack at this or well, Paul Tech <laughs> well, shot it as well. Well, the reason I'm, I'm saying is we go ahead, go ahead. Go ahead. Yes, sir. So so it's a, it's a, a uh, in, incredibly complex ecosystem, uh, and and it, it, cyber introduces some some interesting. Uh, complications to the existing systems that are in place. So what is the relationship between our Army Cyber with an operational mission and our RDECOM with a, an S&T mission and ASALT with a, an acquisition mission? Uh, and, and so determining where the cyber touch points are into these established communities is an incredibly challenging process that, that, we're, that we're taking on uh, via some, some smaller scale pilot activities to help define what the right process is. Uh, how do we extrapolate cyber requirements from PEOs that, that, where, that several of them touch into to cyber? How do, how do we take industry developed systems and correlate them back to developments that happen in the S&T community within the Army. These are very challenging problems, but we're, but we're, we're taking on specifically in, uh, towards a, a, a big data proof of concept how to establish these right processes um, and, and determine what the future looks like in terms of the right interaction and touch points. Right, so, uh, so the answer is yes, we have a requirements document and uh, Jeff, Jones, I'm sure he's here. He can just stand off on the side and he can talk about that after. Uh, second is, because of the acquisition processes, when I work with the Army Acquisition Executive, uh, Dr. Shu and uh, General Phillips, uh, we primarily have to rely on the JSITS process, which they re recognize is not fast enough for what we need to do. And so what Paul talked about is we're trying to find some little pilots that we can use to determine what that process should be. Uh, you know, I normally define it in terms of you have DARPA, you have Army Contracting Command, you have ASALT. Uh, and how do we, how, what are the lines in between those? What should we be able to just to contract the different colors of money? You know, we're not good at buying platforms as a service or code as a service. Uh, it's just very difficult because cyber is not something that we're material that we're normally used to going after. That said, a lot of work going on uh, under the leadership of General Phillips right now to get after this very specific problem. But the answer is we have requirements documents, a couple of them, two, two or three, that are broad enough to be able to put a number of different capabilities that are needed. So, so if I could just broaden that question just a little bit, uh, just because of what I was listening to before. <clears throat> Clearly we talked about, you know, cyber's joint. Uh, S&T development we've talked about in some cases, people are making investments, Bobby was speaking of this, 
Uh, quite, quite, quite frankly, we don't know what the return on investment is because they don't know, necessarily manifest themselves in a capability. So the question I would have from a requirement standpoint is, yes, it's probably important that you have a requirements document and we're doing some things in s but what are we doing across the joint perspective? How are we attacking joint S&T in terms of cyber and what, what sort of is taking place from that standpoint? I think that's probably to me. And yep. um, <laughs> we, we on the joint staff are responsible for the requirements. OSD does the policy. Uh, we do the requirements and the facilitation uh, and the services execute is a simple way to break it down. We um, do have JSIDS documents. Uh, we have a process. Um, process to me personally is a four letter word that's just drawn out and torques everybody off. I think that uh, we really, really need to work better and decide that we need to have more simple requirements that are not at such a level of detail that it causes us to take a long time to get stuff through and causes people to disagree in, in concept or culture with what we want to do. Uh, and then we just need to drive them. Uh, we've had, we do uh, uh, paper, uh, JROX, when we have to get something through quick. Uh, we meet with the, the big guys constantly. The chairman runs uh, tanks. And the director runs op steps. Uh, JIE is a subject that pops up uh, pretty regularly, at least quarterly. Each of the services are given a scorecard. We just expanded that to the combatant commands as well so that it shows clearly who's on and who's not, who's playing, who doesn't want to play, and who's hiding behind some contract for saying, that they can't do it because they have a contract with uh, a particular company to run their stuff. So we, uh, I'll take that one for action here. Uh, I need to work closer with the different service uh, cyber guys and make sure that we all have a common understanding on what we ought to do first, assign leads, and just go for it. Okay, very cool. Uh, let, me, let me turn a little bit here to some other aspects of industry. Um, so th this sort of question gets to talking about uh, needs from industry. Uh, it starts out, as we were referenced here, it says, uh, General Sorensen, you selected, you started the panel talking about thumb drive attacks. There are already COTS devices available today that eliminate the attack vector using thin clients. Uh, for industry, what do you want to see uh, more innovation and investment to reduce the attack surface and mitigate advanced persistent threats? Uh, like what happened most recently with the Navy. So, you know, in some cases we talked about S&T, we've talked about some tools, we've talked about you know, sort of capabilities. So, Ed, yeah, go so ahead. I'll jump on this. So, I, I think the Open Web Security Project lays out the top ten attack vectors. And one of those, uh, I think we've got to start trying to eliminate the vector as even an option. So, right now we build just little patches and, and what happens is you fix that attack vector and they change a few lines of code and it comes back. And maybe we have to eliminate the entire attack vector. I'll take an example like phishing. Phishing, uh, you know, where you're sent a link and you click, this is the target attack, right? You click on the link, boom, uh, they own your machine. Uh, when I was at Stanford, they, I was talking about how this is a real problem for the Army and what were the education ideas that could help. And, they said they don't think this could be solved through education. It has to be solved through technology. I said, well, what, what would be a, a vision of what you're talking about? He goes, how about the idea that every device has a virtual device that works for its uh, web browsing, and when you click on it, the virtual device is the one that goes forth and comes back. He goes, by the way, there's a lot of people working on it because whoever invents this is going to make a fortune. <laughs> and I'm like, uh, uh, but these, I think we've got to start taking entire attack vectors down, and we don't have to look far because the Open Web Security Project does a great job of laying out the top ten that face us every day. So there's been a couple questions here also about offensive operations. I know we can't, I know, I know, we're not going to go there to, to any great extent, but I guess the question becomes, you know, what, what can you say with respect, and I'll sort of read this here, uh, about some of the offensive capabilities we are developing. Um, it has been presented, you presented uh, this as, you know, cyber, is, cyber war is a menace. How are we prepared to protecting our forces? But nothing has been said about offensive actions and nothing about laws or rules of engagement. At the same time, strategic, operational, and tactical level are mixed, and one action at the lower level can produce a strategic effect not only in the enemy but also in our capabilities. 
Uh, how is the Army working on this part of cyber? And, and related to that was the question here about uh, um, clearly, you know, uh, General Cardone previously stated that we must learn how to operate while being compromised. General Bowman stated that we have to protect our IP. Many advisors are out there trying to deny us a service but are exfiltrating our basic our IP. How do you balance these operational capabilities and compromise um, and protect data exfiltration? So it is talking about a little bit of offensive operations, and if you can just address some of that to, to give some idea in terms of even the teams, and maybe Maureen, you want to pile in on this a little bit, but sort of how, how are we attempting to basically make sure we are having capable forces within the offensive capability as well? So I said thank you. As you watch what Mr. Snowden is releasing, you can see there's some quite amazing capabilities out there. I'll leave it there. Uh, the, um, I do want to highlight, though, that here's one of the challenges with cyber. So I'm a brigade combat team commander in Iraq, and I want to do something to this computer, you know, by one of the Shia militants that was in my area. The authorities to do something with that are, I'd have to go way up the chain. But for me as a combat team commander, I have plenty of Title X kinetic authorities that I don't need to go way up the chain. I can take, you know, lethal or kinetic action against it. And so General Alexander and, uh, and I'd say the entire Joint Staff has been working hard to get the right authority levels. But with that, we have to have the right oversight. And so the amount of oversight on our operations is enormous. And uh, all of us are, uh, uh, for example, all of our operators must be recertified every 30 days on, on oversight. I mean, I don't think people realize that the controls that are on what they can do are extensive, and that's to protect the trust. True. So uh, all I could say is, uh, you know, we got to try and stay ahead as, as fast as we can. Uh, I shouldn't say as fast as we can, as hard as we can, because what really kind of scares us is the unknown unknown, right? And so how do, how do you know that? And this is the absolute essential correlation of intelligence and cyber. Mm -hmm. And uh, it's not just cyber intelligence, it's intelligence and cyber. And I think that we have to maintain uh, are traditionally strong strengths in that area if we're going to maintain a competitive advantage in operational space. Yeah, I think the flipping of the uh, signal between offense and defense is happening in nanoseconds. And the problem is you've got to have warfighters and operational capabilities that can, in many cases, make that leap uh, in nanoseconds. And I don't know, Maureen, you want to speak with, with a little bit of commentary in terms of what's taking place at the JFHQ? Absolutely, sir. Um, you know, looking at this holistically from U.S. Cybercom, from the Service Cyber Components Joint Force Headquarters and the Cyber National Mission Force, you know, we look at this as, and General Alexander would be the first to discuss defending the nation. How, how do we as a Department of Defense defend the nation? And, and some of our authorities are very much limited to defending, for example, dot mill networks, but that's not necessarily what we need to do to defend the nation because the threat may not be actually on the dot mill enclaves itself and it may be going after other things. So how would we do that? And in very, very early stages of cyberspace, we're really evolving the authorities and the doctrine that will come. But just as, as General Cardone spoke to, we all know, especially in the Army, after being in Afghanistan and Iraq for so long that the authorities, when required, will likely come. The key is, do we have the people, the tools, the capabilities to leverage what we need to do when we do get the authorities to come? And that's really the key to building this cyber force now and building that to a trained standard that's able to be both very proficient, but also very disciplined with all the intelligence oversight and the oversight from a Title X authority's perspective, because the, the second and third and fourth and fifth and sixth order effects of a cyber event are not well known and are not easy to model and are not easy to, to determine. And so in order to do that, that's why we're, we're very cautiously 
examining just how we have to do that. Um, I would tell you, though, that you know, when we look at cyberspace and we're talking about defending the nation, what Mr. Fechthaus talked to with respect to the hierarchies of our you know, government and especially military organizations some, sometimes are not very conducive to reacting very aggressively to what we need to do. So the, the C2 of what it is that we're trying to execute, horizontal and vertical integration, very rapidly, the sharing common situational awareness so that we can execute and act is really what we're trying to get after. And so without you know, looking at specifically an offensive capability for purely an offensive act, but looking at, for example, if we have an adversary actively maneuvering within the dot mill domain that we have the authority to operate within, right now identifying that tradecraft and identifying that threat of that actor and doing something about that particular activity is something that we're not really haven't really been looking at from the standpoint of protect and defend. But those very same skill sets are very applicable to the, to the other side. If we do, when we do get the authorities to do a purely offensive act in defense of our nation, we will have the tools and capabilities to do that. Very easy to, to morph over into that. And I think that that's really, right now, if we're talking about 6,000 people that we're growing this force now, we need to train those people and equip those people to defend adequately and appropriately. I think that's the place to start. Okay. Go Back ahead. to the original question on intellectual property. Uh, bad guys are stealing it, good guys are giving it away. We need to look at the good guys giving it away by doing things they shouldn't be doing, using personal devices that aren't secured at all, bringing stuff home, <laughs> leaving it out, uh, just letting people collect it just by giving it away. We call it a spillage when we put classified information on the wrong network. Um, wrong term. There's a new policy that's being, uh, it's in the final steps of staffing for the SecDef signature, which should happen in the next couple of weeks, that calls it a negligent discharge of classified information. We ought to treat it like that. Commanders ought to know. It ought to be tracked. There's two COCOMs that are already doing it. The Joint Staff's already tracking it that way. It's an individual accountability that we need to have everybody understand that they are responsible for what they have and what they do. So thank you, Mark. Um, and on behalf of the panel here in AUSA, I just want to thank you for your attendance today. I think when you begin to see here in terms of the complexity, and I apologize up front here, we did not get to all the questions, but we tried to get through most of them here. But operationalizing cyber is, is just not a trivial matter. Uh, you, you've got a lot of moving parts, a lot of moving piece parts, a lot of moving processes, people, technology, and at the end of the day, it is going to be chaos. Uh, and so if you're not able to deal with that, uh, it probably isn't something that you want to begin to venture into. Uh, because as we talked about it, training all these people, civilians, military, having that, if you will, kept up to speed, all the changes that Bob talked about with respect to uh, technology, which is evolving almost minute to minute in terms of second to second uh, with new capabilities. Uh, but then back to the whole thing about operational command. Uh, how do we make sure that we are capable of defending the network, making sure that we have it to secure, uh, as well as in affording the ability to conduct offensive operations on that network. Uh, it is going to be challenging, uh, and the only thing I can say, you know, if you're waiting for someone to give you their, all the answers, you're, you're just waiting for the wrong thing. You're going to have to continue to work with all sorts of aspects of this, work with the people, continue to engage, uh, because this field is evolving, as uh, General Cardone said, on not only uh, an evolving basis, but I would say explosionary, exponentially. So thank you very much.